When I was growing up, there was a season that for many summers, the Donaldson family reunion was held down at Galveston Bay. We were in a three-story house there on the bay, and the cousins who we grew up like siblings, we had the first floor, and it was such a great time. There was a paddle boat that that house had, and it was right outside our room and on the dock. We could paddle all over the bay if we desired, and we did. And so one time my cousin Michael Paul, as if to call dibs, walked out there and he put his foot on that boat that was not tied down. And as it started to push off from the water, he started to get further and further spread apart. And it was quite humorous, quite embarrassing for him. And he fell into the water and scraped up his thighs and got picked on. He was younger than us. Eventually, he made it out into that and had a good time. But isn't that true in life? What we put our feet on, what we plant our feet on is the foundation for who we are. That's what this story is about this morning. As we continue in the third Sunday of Lent, Lent, remember, is a period of time 40 days before Easter, not counting Sundays. And during this season of Lent, we are in a church-wide, a campus-wide worship series called Altered, the Transforming Power of Surrender, journeying through the Old Testament, looking at stories of sacrifice and surrender at the altar of God. And this morning, we're looking at this story from Elijah's life. Elijah was a prophet of God. He was a peculiar kind of person who learned to exercise a particular kind of power for the good of the world to the glory of God. And we first meet him in 1 Kings chapter 17, just one chapter before what we read. And there his peculiarity is evident right off the bat. Elijah announced a great drought for many years, and it came to be. He lived in the wild and was fed by ravens and never caught any bird-carrying disease. He provided for a widow and even raised her son from the dead. Elijah learned to exercise a particular kind of power. But nowhere was that power of God on display any more than the story that we just read, the story that we find ourselves in this morning. Elijah's ministry rose to prominence around the same time that Ahab became the king of Israel. That's at the end of 1 Kings chapter 16. Of Israel's 19 kings spanning over two centuries. None of them were fit for office. It says repeatedly of these kings that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. But of Ahab, it says, he did more evil than any of the kings that ever came before him. Elijah was one of Ahab's fiercest critics and did not hesitate to speak truth to power and call out the most chief executive office in all the land. Many others had their hope and stock in that office. And it meant sure and certain peril for them. And all of this, none of it set well with King Ahab. And so in 1 Kings 18, there's a showdown on Mount Carmel. The people of Israel were enamored by the culture of the day. They were entrapped by it, enticed by it. And they had a long history of wanting to be like all the other nations in the world around them. They came by it, honestly, it's called the human condition, sin. And it's still running rampant in the world today. And Elijah pushed back on that. And in 1 Kings 18, 21, he called out the people of God. How long will you waver? In this scene from Elijah's life, the people of Israel were wavering between two opinions. And on the one hand, they acknowledged the Lord as God and followed him. And on the other hand, they were infatuated with Baal, the god of storm and fertility. His harem of three goddesses were primarily concerned with sex and war. And together, they controlled the weather, the seasons, the fruitfulness of both earth and humanity. And those gods, lowercase g, their lewd sexual behavior 
was imitated as flattery, as manipulative tribute. And if you're reading through the Bible in a year, just today, we're reading Deuteronomy 16, verse 21 says, do not set up a wooden Asherah pole beside the altar you build to the Lord your God. One of the goddesses, Asherah. Moses was speaking into this long before Elijah called it out. Several weeks ago, Brandy referenced G.K. Chesterton, who wrote, every one of us, every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is really looking for God, speaking truth. You could say the same for those who search the web trolling for adult content or who are enticed by power, prestige, position, possessions, or even creature comforts and rich foods and name it. Humanity is hungry for God and they know it not. But what's sad is when God's people are hungry for God, searching for him in all the wrong places, we are called to be different. We are called to live differently, to look different than the world around us. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with some of those things, but I am saying we ought to wrestle with them, struggle with who or what is ultimate in our lives, because when we don't, that's what it means to waver between two opinions. Elijah would have none of it. And he called it out in 1 Kings 18, 23. He challenged 450 prophets of Baal and he invited the people to decide for themselves, to choose for themselves. Both he and the prophets of Baal were to offer up a sacrifice on their altar of choice to their God and to see which offering would be consumed. And Elijah allowed the prophets of Baal to go first. And in Baal's absent impotence, he began to taunt them, mocking them. The Living Bible is a paraphrase of the Bible. And in 1 Kings 18, verse 27, it says, Elijah says to these prophets, you'll have to shout louder than that to catch the attention of your God. Perhaps he's talking to someone or is out sitting on the toilet. Or maybe he's away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be wakened. And nothing happened. Church, when you are in the middle of a crisis of faith, there is no substitute for the real thing. When you're in the middle of a crisis of belief, there is no substitute for the one true God. And so what should we do? Repair the altar. Elijah taunted the prophets of Baal when their God did nothing. Then in verse 30, he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. So far in our time together, these three weeks, this series, we've seen Noah built an altar, the first altar in the Bible. The first thing he did after he walked out of the ark was build an altar and make a sacrifice unto the Lord. Priority reveals expectation, and it shapes and forms the experience that we had. Noah knew that. We've also seen Abraham build an altar to sacrifice a calling, a dream, a purpose, and that experience shaped the rest of his life, and just as soon as he gave it up to God, God gave it right back. Full commitment leads to faith formation. And that is true of Abraham, but it's also true of his people. Full commitment leads to faith formation. And that followed Abraham the rest of his lives. It even is our experience this morning. Elijah repairs the altar and he reminds us, when you're in the middle of a crisis of faith, there's no substitute for the one true God. No one noticed that the altar was torn down. You understand no one except for Elijah. Maybe people were distracted by shiny things. Maybe they were infatuated by instant gratification or all the creature comforts. Maybe they had a fear of missing out 
on what was going on around them. So Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord. He dug a trench around it. He arranged wood on it. He dismembered this bull and placed it on it. And then in order to eliminate any ambiguity or guessing, he had 12 pitchers of water and saturated that altar and the offering on it. And in the midst of all that activity, in verse 32, the writer slips something in about two seahs of seed. That's approximately 24 pounds in weight, about 22 quarts in volume, and maybe it's a subtle reference to the grain offering found in Leviticus chapter 2. Two seahs of seed, this grain offering, it was something that everyone could participate in. Whether they were rich or poor, that grain would have been ground into flour, mixed with oil and incense, and burned on that altar. And if you couldn't afford the incense, well, you could bake bread, and it achieved the same purpose, this fragrant aroma rising up to God, who found it pleasing. This offering was like paying a tribute or giving honor, recognizing the one who had all the authority over you. And in the ancient Near East where they were living at the time, it was written in Leviticus, kings often took care of their subjects, of those under their rule and reign, and the grain offering was a way of acknowledging that king, giving thanks to that king. For Israel, it was a way of saying thank you to their God and king, which is an act of worship, which is all of life. Worship is all of life. And we do things similar in nature, like praying over our meals before we eat, recognizing that what we eat comes from the hand of God who provides all that we need. Or when we pass the plates, we ask God to bless our stewardship and find us faithful with the first fruits that we put in that offering plate. These simple acts of worship are ways of saying, God, you are first. You have authority over my life. You are ultimate in my life. And I won't let anything else, anyone else take that place. And this is exactly how God designed humanity, you and me, to be. For something or someone to rule over us, to have authority completely over our lives. And that someone is God. And when we offer up our first fruits, when we offer up our best, we are putting God in the rightful place on the throne of our heart, on the throne of our lives. And we see this underscored and emphasized way back in the beginning of it all. Genesis chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel. Over the course of time, Abel kept flocks, Cain worked the soil, and Cain brought some of his crops to the Lord, but Abel brought the fat and offered that from the firstborn up to the Lord as a sacrifice, fat portions being the best. It says that God looked with favor on Abel and his sacrifice, but he did not on Cain's. And that made Cain angry and it resulted in murder. He killed his brother Abel, and all of that had nothing to do with burnt offerings or grain offerings, which is better, but everything to do with offering God our best, putting God first, keeping him as ultimate on the throne of our lives, and that is very hard work. Just like grounding the seed into flour is very hard work. If you can imagine the Israelites in the promised land after having everything handed to them in Egypt, after having all this manna provided for them in the wilderness, now they've got to provide for themselves and grind the seed and offer this up to God. And we walk the aisles of our grocery stores and just pull it off the shelf. It's important for us to offer up to God thanksgiving, to give him our best to offer our first fruits to God. That's what the grain offering was, a way of acknowledging God's ultimate authority in our lives. And so for Elijah, to repair the altar meant a reset for the people of God, a repositioning of themselves to encounter God's presence 
to experience the Lord and all of his glory. And just like we've talked about, whether prayer before eating or offering and praying over the plates, there are regular and rhythmic ways that we do that. Remind ourselves, he is ultimate. He provides all. We give him our best. We give him our first. And as we do that, our faith, our faith is renewed. After all of Elijah's preparations, repairing the altar, arranging the wood and the parts of the bull, and drenching it with water, after all of that, Elijah exercised a particular kind of power for the good of others, to the glory of God. And in verse 38, the fire of God fell and it consumed the altar and the sacrifice. Whew. Even the soil, even the water that was around it, consuming everything. And most certainly for the good of the people who when they saw this, they fell prostrate on the ground and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God, verse 39. Say that with me. The Lord, he is God. Their faith was renewed. The prayer of a righteous person was powerful and effective, but it was the activity of God that set all that on fire, even igniting their response in that moment. Leviticus 2.13 says, season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings because the salt is a reminder that God made a covenant with his people and God keeps his covenant. Yes. A permanent promise to be their God, to provide all that they need, to save them not just one moment in time, but moments all the time to the uttermost. That's sanctification. And our God is actively doing that even now, inviting us into that here and now. And that was jump, jump started when God stepped down out of heaven in the person and work of Jesus who gave God a face and a name, revealing his character. Jesus lived and died a brutal death. He died your death and mine. He took our punishment on. And on the third day, he got up. He was raised from the dead. After a period of time, Jesus ascended into heaven. And when he did, because he did, the spirit came at Pentecost and the church was born. The Spirit came into those who repent, those who receive, those who realize their need. And in that moment, Pentecost, Jesus went from being someone on the outside of us. Hey, God, good to see you. <laughs> to the one who lives inside yes. of those who receive this promise, this gift of his presence, those who return to the altar repeatedly, and sometimes we need to repair this altar. Christ in you, bringing with him the hope of all glorious things that are to come. So the question this morning, is he in you? Because that is everything. And that's what it means to be in Christ, to be Christian, to be the church. All of these people walking around with Christ in them as if Christ were walking around in your shoes. That's the goal. Church, how long will we waver between two opinions? Whether that is politics, ideology, putting false hope in possessions or prestige over and against the one true God. We're positioning ourselves for embarrassment, living a gospel that is contrary to the truth. Our feet are to be firmly planted on Christ, the one true God. And so what are those things 
that divide your allegiance and loyalty to him. It's on us to identify them this morning, to surrender them on the altar so that the fire of God can fall and consume them. And it's not that those things are bad in and of themselves, but when they are ultimate in our lives. So let's offer up the first fruits of our lives. Let's be thankful for the blessings in our lives, things that God provide, and let's keep him ultimate because he alone is worthy. Yes, he is. The Lord, yes. he is God. Yes. Let's pray into that. Lord, we are grateful for your provision in all of life, especially salvation, especially the gospel, especially for this reminder that we're about to receive. And so we eat and drink you in this morning. This is our response as we come to this, your altar. And as we do, would you move among your church, move in and through your church? Come, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.